All right, so in this last piece that we're going to talk about is, um, it's going to lead us into conditional probability, which means that we have dependent events. This table that we see here is just information, right? You've seen, you know, it's just, it's like, oh, it's a table of information of males and females that were right and left-handed. But it's so much more than that, right? So it gives us two variables like gender that is corresponded to which hand the person writes with. We call this a, either um, you can hear it as a two-way table or a contingency table. And we usually say like this table would be, in this case, we would have um, this column here. So the hand they write with by gender, that's how we would say the word by would be in there. And when we say by gender, then we know that those are the columns. It's a little tedious, so we don't have to worry about it in this class. If we were in a statistics class, yeah, we would. <laughs> So um, essentially we can see that there are a lot of uh, more right-handed people, right? There's some information we can see just by glancing. We do know that it was very, very nicely selected, right? As um, very stratified, 50-50. Okay, so there's gonna be a, we can actually from a two-way table or contingency table find a lot of probabilities, right? So find the probability of a randomly selected individual to be male and left-handed. So this is kind of nice because all we really need when we write this out is that we need male and left-handed. Well, all we really need is that basic fraction probability formula, right? Because we actually know the number of people that are right and left-handed by gender, we know we could see, well, how many people are male and left-handed out of the number of um, people in the sample? Well, the number of male and left-handed is 12. So it'll be 12 out of 100. But of course, we want to reduce that into um, 3 25ths or... Um, we could say that if we wanted a decimal, it would be equal to 0.12 or percent Y is 12%. Usually when the fractions are really nice like this, we leave in um, reduced fraction form. Okay, let's find the probability of a randomly selected individual to be male or left-handed. So the probability of male or left-handed is equal to, now we're gonna use that um, or formula, right? This means that this is gonna be the probability of male or the probability, so or means plus the probability of left-handed, but minus, right, that probability of a male and left-handed. Okay, so the probability of randomly selecting one individual that is male would be 50 out of 100. The probability of selecting a left-handed person would be 20 out of 100. See how easy it is to grab the numbers from a two-way table? I just like love it so much, it's so easy minus and then that intersection remember like here's all the male there's might be a person in there and here's all the left-handed people might be in there so you're double you want to make sure to get rid of all your double dipping right so male and left-handed are there any so here's male left-handed we said 12 out of 50. i mean 12 out of 100 sorry about that Okay, and we kept the common denominator of 100, so we could add these two and then subtract. So 50 plus 20 is 70, and 70 minus 12 is 58. Out of 100. Of course, we can always reduce that, right? 
and we can always reduce it to um, 29 out of 50, right? Or it can be a percent of 0.58 or 58%. So we can always rewrite it as a decimal or a fraction or a percent. All right, let's try the next one. The probability of randomly selecting an individual to be woman given she is right-handed. Ooh, there's a new word for us, right? So given. What does that mean? Well, it actually means that we're telling you that this person's right-handed. We're giving you a hint, right? So that means that take Take the sample of people that are right-handed and only stick your hand in that sample and grab a woman. So notice the denominator is going to be different. It's not out of 100 people anymore. It's out of the number of right-handed people. And then how can I grab from there the right-handed people and pull out the number that I need? So pull out the woman, right? So the probability that we have a woman given to be right-handed is equal to the number of women that are right-handed right because if i'm if it's given to be right-handed and my sample's only right-handed i'm selecting a woman and right-handed right they're both right but out of everyone who's right-handed so how so and that's where that denominator changes so the fact that it's given she's right-handed changes the denominator Okay, because now you're not looking at the entire sample on your two-way table. You're only looking at the right-handed part of it. So let's go to our table and see how many women and right-handed, right? So here's female and right-handed, 42. Over how many right-handed are we pulling from, right? So right-handed, 80. So the whatever comes after the word given means that that's the sample you're taking. So that's the denominator value. And of course, we can always simplify this to 21 over 40, right? Which is approximately, um, or sorry, Let's see. equal to point, I have it here, 525 or 52 and a half percent. So it just depends what the problem asks for, but usually it's always a reduced fraction or a decimal or percent. So just let's just be careful with this word given, right? Because as we go on to conditional probability, we're now going to see um, how it's going to change, right? And again, I wanted to like revisit that satchel example. If I go back to that satchel example where we were talking about whether he pulls, you know, replaces the card or not, we talked about how if Satchel replaced the card initially after that first draw, it was an independent event. But if Satchel didn't replace the card, we said these aren't independent. And now we're there. Now we would call them dependent events. Essentially, remember I said don't, and I said back then like, always assume without replacement. We really do always assume that in the world. So here it's really important we talk about this because if that's the most common situation, then we need to actually address that, right? So here, if Satchel doesn't replace the card, remember we said that denominator changed. So if he draws a spade and a heart, and we assume without replacement, we can multiply these two, but we know that the denominator changed. The same way that when it was given on the two-way table, right, that the person was right-handed. 
So notice here in the formula, it's still an and formula, but now we just know like this is gonna be our general formula where we always have to think about is our denominator going to be different, right? Is the probability of the second event gonna change, right? And that's only if we have without replacement. So let me write that without replacement. So that's why over here, if you notice that in the next example, I went ahead and did this satchel one, and it said consider the bucky deck of cards, right? What is the probability of satchel drawing a heart without replacing the card in the spade? So we did this prior, and we said it was going to be the probability of drawing a heart and a spade was going to be 13 out of 52 times 13 out of 51. And remember, we said this denominator was different. Okay, and that was only because we were dealing with not replacing the card, right? But it's very well possible that we could have picked, instead of two different suits, I could have picked two hearts, right? Where it could have been 13 and one grabbed and the numerator changes as well. So we're gonna deal with all the little cases. So if we go ahead and just put 13 divided by 52 and then times 13 divided by 51, Um, that's gonna that there's the decimal and I'm gonna hit second table which will hopefully give me a fraction yeah it did so we can get 13 out of 204 right which is approximately 0 0.0637 or 6.37 percent okay so again here's like the little highlight here right without replacing the card changes that denominator. Okay, so let's try an another one. So consider Bucky's deck of cards with his friend Satchel. What is the probability of Satchel drawing two clubs without replacement? So now I'm doing two clubs, right? And once again, that I assume without replacement. So if I'm drawing two clubs, the probability of drawing a club and a club means that I'm gonna have the probability of drawing a club first and so times the probability of drawing a club given you already drew a club. So up here in the formula box, we have a little symbol for that. It's a little, it's a bar and it says B, and essentially it's the phrase B given A as you can see here. So anytime you wanna say B given A, we can just do this little bar and it kinda of makes, it's just symbolic, it just makes it faster to write. So here I could have written B, P of C given club, right, C, like that. It's just up to you, I just write it however I feel. <laughs> okay, so what's the probability of drawing a club on a first draw? Well, if I put my hand in, right here, I ha I know it's a suit, so I have 13 clubs in there out of 52 cards. So that first probability is usually the easiest, right? Times, now it's gonna change. Because if I have 13 clubs in the deck and I drew one, how many clubs left in the deck? I have one, that's right, 12. So 12 are left in the deck out of, well, if I drew a club and I'm holding it on this first draw, right? I have 12 clubs, but I also have one less card in there. And that denominator becomes 51. So the, notice here, these two pieces are um, different than the first probability because of without replacement. And because I was picking the same type of suit, which created a less cards in the suit on the second draw, and then a, a less cards in the deck in general, that's why both de decrease by one. Because you're taking a club, so you have to think about the numerator and denominator. But once you get here, then just put it in the calculator and get a quick answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and go 13 divided by 52 times 12 divided by 51. 
Okay, and I get a decimal. I'm going to try to undo the fraction. Sometimes it's just too much for the calculator, but it seems like it's, it's doing it. So here we're going to have 1 17th, right, which is approximately 0 0.0588 or 5.88%. So this last one, um, this last example is one of my favorites because it's G-Pod and um, you can tell I made up some of these problems um, like the Bucky Satchel. Um, if you're fully into real comics like the old fashioned comics, Bucky and Satchel is a great comic strip and it's about a cat and a dog and the cat's very, very cat, you know, very you know, snobby and like what prestigious and the dog is more like happy go lucky and the owner is totally oblivious to their, their personalities and relationships. So it's a really cute comic. So Bucky and Satchel's from a comic strip that I um, read and um, G pod. I just thought it was fun to go a few letters before the I. <laughs> so suppose G pod manufactures a hundred of their new phones, G phone, because the G phone is new to the cell phone market. Is there an estimated fifth? There is an estimated 15 G phones that are defective out of the hundred for the hundred manufactured. OG, the creator of G phone, decides to test three out of the hundred. What is the probability at least one G phone is defective? So here we can see that. Um, let's write some stuff down. So we have a hundred phones. We know that there are 15 phones defective, right? But if 15 phones are defective, that means that there is 85 that are not defective, right? Because 100 minus 15 is 85. Okay, we also know that we have the probability of at least one, right, formula. So we have a few things that we can see that we're going to need here. So the probability of at least one, and then I'll put of the three, are defective is equal to one minus the probability that none of the three are defective. So I like building it. I know like some students are like, give me the answer fast. But if I like use the formula and like start building what I'm doing, it's just really fast. Like the, the actual fractions itself is fast, but getting there is hard. So just build it, go one step at a time. This is one of the more challenging probability problems. So it makes sense, you know, so that we have to build it. So again, remember that, um, so G, OG is going to go grab some three phones out of a, out of the hundred, out of the palette and test them and make sure they're not defective. So we're finding the probability that if they grab, th if OG grabs three, that at least one of them will be defective. Well, just by the formula of at least one, it's one minus the probability of none. Okay. So this means we're going to have one minus the probability that the first one that he picks or she, um, did it say, uh, they pick is not defective. And the second phone that they pick is also not defective. And the third phone that they pick is also not defective. Well, this is one minus the probability of the first phone and I'll put NF and D, I'm sorry, not defective, times the and, right, the probability that the second phone won't be defective, and means multiply the probability of the third phone not being defective, okay. and that's equal to one minus the probability that now we can do it. So if I go into the, the bin, there's a hundred phones there on that first grab. So how many phones in there are not defective? 
85 times now is he gonna put that phone back and then have that chance of grabbing that same phone no right and so what once you grab the phone he most likely OG will put it on his desk and how many phones left in the box 99 right and how many left that are not defective? Well, you picked one that, here that was not defective. If there were 85 originally and you grabbed one out, that means there's only 84 that are not defective. On that second draw, there are 84 that are not defective out of one less phone in the box, 99, because we assume that OG will not throw the phone, the first phone back in. We assume always without replacement. Time. So now I took two phones out of the box that are not defective, which means that there are 83 phones left in that third drawn that are not defective out of 98 phones left. So now we can go ahead and just put this in the calculator which that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And so we'll do one minus, and I'll just put parentheses so I know here what I'm doing. So 85 out of 100 times, we have to be careful here, 84 out of 99 times 83 out of 98. And then close the parentheses. So there's the decimal. I'm gonna see if it could possibly calculate a a fraction no it didn't so we would have um, one minus uh, that whole thing which is let's estimate it as point three eight nine two okay which is um, or thirty eight point nine two percent okay so what does this mean well this means that if I wanted to interpret this in language, right, I would say that the probability or the chance that OG um, randomly selects three out of the hundred phones in the box um, is 38.92%. So about a 40% chance that if I one of the three phones I select will be um, defective and, the, and that's really what phone companies really do like the mobile phone companies they they assume that there's going to be within the productions and the machines that there's going to be some sort of defective ones so when they make the price of the phones they actually take that in consideration they say okay if there's if 40 percent of the time i'm going to have a defective phone and i produce this many and if I then if I price them here, how much is that going to cost? Okay, that cost. Let's divide it between all the ones that are not defective and add that to the price of the phone. And so the the reason why some mobile phones are a little bit more expensive than others is because their defective rate might be a little higher, or their obviously their pieces are more expensive in the phone. But they do, I just wanted you to be aware that there are mathematicians that work at these huge mobile companies and calculate this kind of stuff. Of course, it's not a hundred phones, it's on a full hundred million phones, right? It's on a very bigger global scale.